course, today, oops, sorry. Today, we're continuing risk society and ecological modernization. And what I will show first. First, let's talk about Beck's conception of a risk society. Um, this is not in any particular order. This is my flow of consciousness analysis of major points. Beck feels what makes the world we live in special is we have new material risks. That's a very Marxist point of view. The material world is very important, but it's the quality of these material risks that are very different. Beck says in the past, material risks we can see, we can smell, taste. Now, nuclear radiation. It may be going over our campus right now, but we don't know. So there's new kinds of material risks that do not connect to our human senses. And this means we depend upon scientists to construct this risk. We need material, we need technologies as extra senses to determine these things. And you can see how this is a conflict view, because maybe the scientist gets their money from the state, or gets their money from the corporation that runs the nuclear power plant. And when they you know, do this research, they tell their boss, you know, we've discovered some radiation in the public. And the boss will say, don't construct that. Don't tell people about this. Um, a good example about this construction of risk, the United States conducted a lot of nuclear tests within the United States, but never announced them to people. This was throughout the 1950s and into the 1960s. There are hundreds of nuclear bombs exploded above ground and underground. The United States never warned people. So many, many occasions, radioactive iodine, radioactive cesium would drift across the United States getting into people, and they get sick, but they would understand, and they would blame something else. So the construction of these new risks that we can't see, taste, or hear is a major thing that Beck feels is a new material reality of our world. And it requires socially constructed risks instead of these natural risks. And we would say natural risks are things we can touch, taste, and feel, like coal pollution, smog within the city. So, risks that require construction. Because of this, Beck felt there's an end of a separation between nature and society. Um, the dichotomy used to be there are social risks created by humans and a natural catastrophe, a tidal wave, a tsunami. Uh, but now, we have an interaction of these risks, Beck feels. It's hard to separate where our bodies are, and where the environmental problems start. Um, a social construction of risk can talk about false safety. The United States refuses to test the Pacific water right now for radiation from Fukushima in Japan. Why? It's not because they have data that says it's not a problem. They're refusing to get the data to see. So, Countries may never talk about these major problems. As I said, I meant to continue this idea of the United States. During the 1950s and 60s, um, the United States did not construct the nuclear bomb tests as a public thing. But the United States did tell the Kodak Corporation. They would tell corporations that we're testing for nuclear radiation. This could destroy your film. So, so film was more important than human lives to running the United States. They were concerned about the problems with film. I find that very, very disgusting. Uh, but many things have happened like that in the U.S. history. Beck says because the new conflict is based on risk and the construction of risk, there's a new environmental class conflict. But it's without some kind of environmental proletariat. There's no common group that experiences the risks and there's no common group that benefits. Everybody gets hurt with these catastrophic large-scale risks. Um, Beck says people begin 
begin to doubt the institutions. We live increasingly, Beck says, going to live in worlds where people distrust the state, they distrust corporations, because they don't see that they are constructing risk accurately or with equal concern. And this means, Beck feels, sub-politics develop. This means uh, formal politics would be what Beck calls politics, but sub-politics would be the politics of the street, where people attack a businessman directly. People sit inside the office of a legislator trying to get them to listen. People attack a coal mining plant. People chain themselves to the fence of a nuclear plant. This is direct action. Beck feels that with this environmental class conflict, we move into a world of very localized and regional sub-politics. And but also, international levels of risk. There's no national proletariat to rise up. There's either an international level of risk, or there are very small levels of risk within a country. Previous forms of politics are national based and institutional based. But now they're sub-political based, and they're based on local activists in different regions and against their own state, sometimes in alliance with local businesses, and on the international level, instead of state direct. Beck is very witty, Beck is a humorous writer, despite talking about such dark things. In Marxism, it's all a conflict about the distribution of material goods, who owns things distribution of goods. Um, but Beck says this environmental class conflict is over the distribution of bads, of, of risk, and everybody wants to escape the risks. The lack of legitimacy of these institutions is very important within this risk society view. But Beck feels this environmental class conflict leads to a democratic politics. One of his famous phrases is smog is democratic. He's very optimistic that large-scale environmental problems include all classes. He felt there would be no class conflict over risk if it's catastrophic. Nuclear power in, well, the world right now, nuclear power in Japan particularly, because it damages the poor and the rich alike, Beck says, it creates a new kind of politics, very different from the politics of class versus class. Beck is also interested in social construction. He analyzes how science, because it constructs these risks, is the source of conflict too. You have people working for corporations of state, and they have a particular view of science. And they tell you, you're not sick from radiation. You're not sick from cancer because of our chemicals. And here's the data, that you may belong to a citizen group and your citizen group does a survey and finds different data. So data versus data. It's not science versus no science. It's science versus science. A lot of people will say it's science versus irrationality. But Beck says, no, it's two different versions of scientific methods constructing risk. And this makes, of course, the lack of legitimacy of existing institutions and more sub-political direct action becomes part of our lives as, politi as politics. To continue this, the sub-politics is the flight from existing formal institutions. People don't trust them, people spend less time on elections and more time on direct action and taking their case to Gunday, taking their case directly to Samsung. They don't try to ask the state to regulate Samsung, they ask Samsung directly by shutting down their factory by maybe sitting in the office of the CEO and not leaving. Direct action becomes a major force. Um, right now, there's lots of sub-politics around the Four River Regiment in Korea, the Four Rivers Project. Um, it's not constructed in the media, but there are many cases where people will chain themselves to the cranes and the building materials to stop the machines from destroying the river. And that's an example of sub-politics. I'll show some examples later. Beck says in the past, in the past we had natural risks. And these were manageable. These were rationalizable. If you're coal miners, if everybody's a coal miner, you can estimate 
how many people get sick from lung disease. And you can help them later. The state can organize a pension for people if they get sick. But nuclear accidents? What about cancer over a million people? There's no way. It's totally unmanageable. You, the state cannot help you. And it's unrationalizable. You can't predict it. Japan, five years ago, they said, well, if we do have a tsunami, it will never reach that level. You know, it'll never be a problem. But tsunami completely covers that area. The estimate was it's over at least 12 meters tall, the wave that hit the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. They were un it's unrationalizable, unpredictable, and they had di diesel backups at Fukushima. But those broke down too. And um, it was unpredictable. And it leads to catastrophic risks. And with catastrophic risks, it doesn't do any good to have institutions. Because the institutions are the ones that created this risk. The Japanese government allowed those nuclear plants to be built on earthquakes, fault lines. They allowed those nuclear plants to be built in front of an area where tsunamis would come. It's their fault. It's the state's fault. So the state cannot be seen as a savior. So the state is delegitimated. And people don't trust larger institutions and move towards local subpolitics uh, as well. The general point, this is how Beck is optimistic. I know this is a, a mouthful. This is a, a long phrase. It's not Beck's phrase. It's my phrase. Beck says we have risk epoch, institutional mismatch. The institutional mismatch is we have very old forms of institutions. We have an institution which could manage risk. It used to be able to rationalize risks. But we have these new material risks, so we need new kinds of institutions to manage this risk. We're in a different epoch. The epoch is a period of time. We're in a different period of time, but we're still within the old institutions that allow and authorize these risks to be created. They try to measure them, but they're catastrophic. And so nobody can ever measure them properly. The standards of risk assessment are foolish. Right now, in most countries of the world, the way that a chemical is put into the environment is like this. Um, in most countries, the business does its own research. So there's an organization of bias. A business might conduct research on genetically modified crops, for instance. Genetically modified crops. And they say there's no risk. And then the government gets the data. That, okay, we'll let you introduce that. Um, it also occurs, you know, here's a carcinogenic chemical, but we find it's such a low rate, it doesn't matter. And the state will say, okay, we've done the research, that's good, we authorize that. But we live in a world where the singular risk assessment doesn't work. We live in a world right now with over 80,000 synthetic chemicals that we've invented in the 20th century. And these don't have an effect by themselves. These have an effect as a group. So you can authorize one chemical, and it really does have a small risk. You can authorize another chemical, and it really has a small risk. But, for instance, I think it's Aldane, and uh, if there are two versions of pesticides that used to be legal in the United States. They didn't know this. They authorized this, but later they found out these two put together, the risk is 500 times. So there's no system that really measures the real world. You construct it as a single item going into the world, and that's a limited risk. But once the real world is there, the risk is huge. And the state is not monitoring that. So Beck says, the institutional mismatch, you have a wrong way of looking at risk assessment. And Beck is optimistic because he wants new institutions. Any comments or questions about just the first slide? 